Um, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us this afternoon. My name is Xiomara Melendez, the Senior Coordinator for Access and Transition with the Office of Student Success. Welcome to Cal Poly Pomona's Multi-Factor Admission Model webinar. This session is being recorded and will be available on the Educator Resource site. All attendees are muted, but throughout the webinar, we will be pausing for questions. So we ask that you please hold from typing your questions while our presenters introduce the model. Once the model is introduced, use the Q&A box to ask any of the questions. And then supporting today's webinar behind the scenes are colleagues from the Educational Opportunity Program, Outreach Office, Office of Admissions, and Project Aminos. Presenting this afternoon are my colleagues from the Office of Admissions, Brandon Tuck and Julie Chang. Without further delay, I introduce you our presenters. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. I'm Brandon Tuck. I'm the Interim Director of Admissions. Like Zia Mara said earlier, uh, Julie Chang is here. She'll be a, she's the Associate Director of Admissions, and she'll be assisting with the Q&A. And then we have a special guest today, Jessica Wagner. She's our Senior Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management and Services. I'm going to turn it over to her so she can do a slight introduction, and then we'll get over to the uh, presentation. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Julie. So we are very excited today to present the multi-factor admission model. As you know, there's going to be many different models coming out this year from the different campuses, but I think, you know, it's really important that, uh, that you know, every campus, you look at the models and, and we're here to help and, and guide, but we're very happy about Project Caminos and, um, and have these opportunities to present uh, this in such a level of detail for you. Um, we've got a great, like I said, we got a great admissions team, so I just want to say welcome and we're excited to have you here today. And I'll hand it back over to Brandon and Julie. So we'll get straight into the um, to the model here and what, what was the reason for this change. So the context for the change. As, as some of you know, the uh, SAT test centers were closed um, due to um, the pandemic, due to uh, COVID-19. So the, the ability of students to be able to take uh, the test uh, really was strained. And so we needed to look at a way that we can come up with the admission decisions without having the SAT or ACT as a part of our, our normal calculation. And so in the past, the ACT and the SAT were one of the main factors in us determining whether or not a student was admissible to the CSU system. So the context for the change. So a little more about that. You all are aware that the old model, which we call the eligibility index, was a combination of your GPA and your SAT. So the old calculation was GPA times 800 plus the SAT equals your eligibility index. Under this new model, the SAT is gone. So what we've done is we've taken academic factors plus non-academic factors to come up with what we call the um, Cal Poly Pomona index or the CPP index. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But the key point is we're now bringing in non-academic factors and a few academic factors that we didn't um, include before. So also, all, we put every student who applies uh, to Cal Poly Pomona through our, our model, but there are some changes to our minimum admission eligibility. And so I'll, it's a lot here on the slide, but I'll go through a couple points here that I think will be important for you all. The uh, minimum uh, GPA for California residents is a 2.5. However, a student between a 2.0 to a 2.49, we can still review that student. So that student still goes through our model. And I'll show that in, in a little bit. But for non-California residents, the, the key factors here is uh, 3.0 and above. So there's some slight changes to the GPA, but the, key, the main thing you wanna know is a non-eligible CSU student is someone whose GPA is less than 2.0, so 1.99 and below. And if they're coming from out of state, it's 2.46 and below. So um, those students that are above those GPAs, they go through our model, they're assessed along with everyone else, and then we determine admissibility from there. So applicants, uh, how we evaluate applicants based on uh, their index and uh, GPA, that hasn't changed. Um, but now they're being uh, evaluated as well on multi-factor criteria. So as a uh, campus with impacted programs, we're still going to rank our students based on 
uh, what we call now the Cal Poly Pomona Index. So it's our multi-factor criteria, and then we determine whether or not they're admissible uh, to that program. Next one. So this is um, Cal State Apply. So I, I talked about academic and non-academic factors. So a lot of those non-academic factors that you see are now being included on the application. And there, this is a sample of some of the questions that you'll see. And we take these responses into account when reviewing a student under our new admission model. And so you can see we have educational program participation, yes or no, uh, work information and uh, extracurricular programs are all based on hours. So how many hours you worked um, and what was your extracurricular, how many hours as well um, in the last uh, 36 months. And then the next question is parent and guardian. So we do give points for first gen uh, students. So it's important that an applicant fills out the application in its entirety. So we want them to go in and, and respond to all of these new questions because we use them in our new formula. So now we're gonna talk about the uh, multi-factor admission model and how we came up with the CPP index. So this is a um, sample of, of what the new model looks like. So you, you can see here we have a pass one and a pass two. Pass one determines CSU eligibility. Pass two is Cal Poly Pomona eligibility. So we put everyone through pass one, regardless of your GPA. So you could see it would be A through G GPA times a thousand. And then we give everyone 450 points. So we call those points uh, CPP qualifying applicant points. Similar to how you have on the SAT where you get uh, receive 200 points initially for submitting uh, the test. This is very similar. We give 450 points for submitting the, a successful application. So if you're going to um, pass two, pass two has a combination of our, it's our new factors. This is the multi-factor part of the model. And so you'll see we give points for our local area, as well as those students who may be veterans or military. We don't have a lot of um, high school students coming out that served in the military, but every now and then we do. And so they will get points. And then we have math coursework. So math coursework and math GPA, uh, we do give points for those, for people who are applying to impacted STEM majors. And a couple other factors are the first gen and youth services and campus partnerships. Campus partnerships, we are, are specific groups that we have MOUs, our grants with, and we have formulated a, um, a system for how these students are recognized through our admission model. So it's not for everybody, um, but these are um, designated partnerships. Extracurricular activities. That could be sports, music, drama. There is a, a whole list of things, um, but I encourage students to fill that out when they are doing the application, as well as educational programs. Like I showed in the earlier slide, there's a select list for them to pick from in the application that would qualify. And so if this is Cal Poly Pomona's uh, specific model, but all 23 campuses are different. And one of the things that we were asked to do by the chancellor's office was have the majority of your points come from academic factors. So 86% of our points are derived from academic factors and 14% come from non-academic factors. Now for max points, max points are different depending if you're STEM or not, uh, if you're a non-STEM. And the reason for that is how we incorp incorporate math coursework and math GPA. So if you're non-STEM or you're applying to a non-impacted major, 5190 is the max points that you can, uh, applicant can receive. And if you're applying as a STEM major, it's, it's 5271. What this slide shows here is we, we had a, if you can see the, the orange line that's trending up and behind that is, a, is the blue line. I don't wanna spend a lot of time here, but what we were able to do was recreate an index. So we had our old eligibility index, and now we have the CPP index. And those indexes are, are pretty much the same. You see a couple blips here and there for students who had low GPAs and really high test scores, but for the most part, it's exactly the same. So when we talk about minimum eligibility index was 2950 and under the CPP index, it's also 2950. So we were able to duplicate 
our old system under this multi-factor criteria. So I want to show a couple samples of what students look like. So I just mentioned 2950 is the minimum uh, CSU eligibility. And so you can see here, a student has a 2.5, so it was 2,500 points, and then they received an additional 450 points from the CPP qualifying applicant points. So that put them at 2,950. Now, past two, it's a zero. That's highly unlikely, but I, I just wanted to show you what a minimum student would look like if we put them through the model. So um, I know some people have asked, well, what is a local minimum low, or what does a local student look like? And so if you look here, this is past one, their GPA was 2.64. And so they got uh, 2,640 points plus the 450. So I put them at 3,090. They went on to pass two. They did have some of the criteria. So they're, they're from our local area. It was a non-STEM and they had some non-academic attributes. So they received an additional 120 points. And so that gave them a CPP index of 3,210. So this is a person I, I like to show, they applied to an impacted major, I believe it was mechanical engineering. And under the old um, eligibility index, our old model, the student was actually denied. And the reason why they were denied is that they needed to have above a, a 570 and above on the math portion of the SAT to be admi it, uh, admissible to an impacted uh, engineering uh, program and the person received a 560. So a question or two stopped them from being admitted um, to mechanical engineering. But what you can see here is the student's GPA was a 4.2, and so that gave them 4,200 points plus the 450, so they had 4,650 after pass one. So then they went on to pass two. They had some of the non-academic uh, attributes because it's STEM, so it was probably math coursework, math GPA, and they're non-local. And if I remember correctly, this was also a first-gen student and applying to a STEM major that was impacted. So they received an additional 76 points. And if we were to use this index and look at our uh, index last year, this person would have been admitted into mechanical engineering. So this is a type of student that we want to see a 4.2 GPA and an all-star when it came to the math coursework and the math GPA. So I won't spend a lot of time here. Um, I don't wanna bore you guys to death with uh, data, but um, this, these are kind of some exciting slides and it shows the results of implementing this, this new uh, mo admission model. And so the blue color that you see and the gray our, our old index. So the blue is 20, the 2019 applicant pool. The gray is the 2020 applicant pool. And then those that orange and that yellowish orange color, those are under our new CPP index. So what you can see is by using this new CPP index, we admitted slightly more students. The biggest jump being in um, hospitality on the left, HCA, that has the biggest spike, but overall, it's just a little slight bump from here, you know, from each college. It's not huge, just little increases here and there. So just to show you where the increases are, it's all across the board. So when you look at local students being um, admitted, you can see a, an increase, a slight jump. So from 2019, it's a 6% increase and then 2% for uh, fall 20. And then when you look at non-local, there's a slight increase there as well. Not as high as when you look at locals, but a slight increase. So when you look at impacted programs, there's also an increase at the impacted level as well as the non-impacted level. So again, just a slight increase across the board. So gender. So under this new model, we are admitting more female students. So you can see the jump um, when you look at fall 19, it's a 6% jump. Fall 20, you see a 4% increase. And so these are percentages, by the way. So you can see the percent. So this is now our impact on diversity. So underrepresented minorities, this uh, new model um, benefits them greatly. You can see the, the increase alone just in fall 19 
in fall 20. And, and keep in mind, we're using the same, we're using our old applicant pool. So this is not with outreach doing anything different. These are our existing um, uh, applicant pools from uh, previous terms. And then you see for the non-underrepresented minorities, a slight dip. Won't spend a lot of time here, but the biggest jump here is an African-American um, students being admitted, as well as Hispanic students. You can see the largest percent change. Those are the ones on the left um, have the biggest increase. So um, you can see again, underrepresented uh, minorities uh, being admitted. So it's, uh, it's to impacted program. So this is exciting to see that we have more underrepresented minorities being admitted into our um, impacted programs, which are predominantly STEM programs. Okay, so focusing more on the right, because we've talked about um, diversity as far as race and ethnicity, but um, when we look at uh, female students being admitted to impacted programs, we see an increase, and it's a pretty substantial increase with this new model. And then uh, male students, it's about flat. So uh, some of the results that we found, we also looked at student success indicators. So using GPA as a term, uh, a way to track student success, and we saw no difference between our old eligibility index and the CPP index when looking at um, student success. So the success outcomes were still the same. That being said, we did see some students, even though they had a higher SAT and ACT, they had a low uh, GPA performance once they enrolled here at Cal Poly Pomona. So what we started to see is that the test scores aren't necessarily an indicator of strong academic performance. And like I said earlier, we have a direct correlation between our old eligibility index and the new CPP index that were created under this MFA model. We have a website, it's, it's up and live. Um, the more of these, uh, uh, presentations we do, we we add more to our facts. So our facts is kind of a growing list, but um, some of the questions um, that you may think of later or forget to ask, you will find on our website. Our website also goes a little more in depth into the calculation um, and talks about the current status of the SAT and the ACT in regards to it being suspended. So these are some of the questions that that pop up all the time. How will we verify non-academic attributes? I know this is a big one, especially with a lot of the admission scandals that are going on at, on other, um, at other universities. And so I, I always like to say um, that the application is legally binding. So what a student puts on the application, we presume that is factual. And, if, uh, and it's self-reported, but that means that we can ask beyond the transcript for other supporting documents to verify what they put on the application is accurate. And then um, credit and past grades, I know that was accepted um, last, uh, what was it, winter, spring, and summer 2020 because of COVID. From now on, students are expected to have letter grades. And those um, credit and past grades do not negatively impact their overall um, GPA. The SAT, SAT scores, can they still be submitted? Yes, and I actually encourage students to do so, uh, mainly for academic pl uh, placement purposes. We are not using it for admission, and uh, we're not allowed to. None of the CSU is allowed to do so, but it is um, key for academic placement. It may help students quite a bit. And do all CSUs have the same multi-factor admission criteria? No, we don't. Um, it's quite different. The uh, chancellor's office is working on putting a, a website together that will display all of the models, um, but every campus is different. And this is our timeline. The application is open as of last Thursday, and the deadline is 12-4. We allow students to do a change of major up until uh, December 7th, except students are not allowed to change into an impacted um, major. Um, admission decisions are February, early March, and the intent deadline is 5-1, so May 1st. And um, AP scores are July 15th. I, I highly encourage students to do that, especially if they're looking to receive uh, college credit for those um, AP scores.
And then on that same deadline of July 15th, final transcripts are due. We wanted to make sure that you're aware that we are continuing to provide virtual services. And so one of them being through the services that we have through Project Caminos. Project Caminos is dedicated to continue to support prospective students and families with their college discovery selection and transition to the university. Um, if you notice on our website, you can visit us and you have the email, I'm sorry, the web address on your screen. You can visit us to see the full workshop calendar. We are currently in partnership with our two community, I'm sorry, our two main districts, which are the Pomona Unified School District and Shafee Joint Unified School District. And so this year, as Brandon mentioned, there's a number of non-academic factors, one of them being campus partnerships. Project Aminos is part of one of those um, campus partnerships. And so students that are applying for fall 2021 will be able to join any of our workshops if they are able to participate participate in four workshops, then we will use that for a special admissions consideration for fall 2021 first time freshman applicants. And again, students are able to see the full workshop schedule that is available on our website. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Samara, for having us be part of this wonderful uh, workshop. My name is Dulce Guerrero. I'm one of the outreach uh, counselors here at Cal Poly Pomona. And although uh, we are providing virtual learning through our instruction mode right now due to the pandemic, I just want to reiterate that our offices are open and providing services uh, virtually as well. So we do have five counselors in our office and we all each service a certain area. Um, so definitely take a picture of our phone number and our email address if you have any inquiries. Um, we certainly do have uh, live walk-in sessions Monday through Friday, and we try to actually provide opportunities in the morning and in the afternoon, depending on the students' um, schedule. So Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, uh, students and prospects can connect with uh, counselors um, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. We continue to have pre-admission advising as well, so if you want something more of a personal appointment, that's done virtually either through a Zoom invite or phone. You can certainly schedule um, an appointment by connecting with our office. If you are definitely interested in having one of our representatives come out and talk to your students about Cal Poly Pomona, you can certainly put in a request for an outreach representative as well. And also official campus tours. We actually have them virtually as well, Monday through Friday, one at 9 a.m. and another one at 2 p.m. So definitely direct students that are interested our way. Upcoming events that are happening that we'd like to advertise is CSU Week, which was a combination of the uh, counselor conferences. Campuses have an opportunity to go and speak to educators and prospects about their campus, provide highlights. Some of these sessions that already passed have been recorded and they will be available on the Chancellor's Office website. In addition to this, there's additional events that are happening and they're going to be ending this week. So if you are interested, definitely look on the website RSVP for the events and I know that this week there's going to be some college fairs happening where many of the Cal States are going to be um, participating. Specifically for Cal Poly Pomona we are going to have our Explore CPP event and it's going to be for two weeks and we're very excited to announce it and invite everyone. Um, students will have an opportunity to connect with our academic colleges. So if you have students that are interested and want to learn more specifics about what we have to offer, whether Cal Poly Pomona is going to be a good fit for them, definitely direct them our way, have them register through our event. Um, Monday through Thursdays for those two weeks, there's going to be academic colleges presenting. And on Fridays, students and families will have an opportunity to connect with campus partners from the Office of Admissions to Financial Aid and so forth. So definitely encourage students to um, participate in our Explore CPP event. Another event that our Office of Outreach is putting together is going to be Poly Nights. Feel free to direct any prospects and their families. Um, we're going to have an event on Tuesday, October 13, and another one on a Saturday, November 14. And basically, it's to provide students that opportunity, again, that platform to get connected if they're not able to attend our Explore CPP event, or if they do and they have additional questions, this is a wonderful opportunity to also connect with our wonderful staff. As you, we continue on, you're going to see our contact information, but we have the rest of the time to be able to answer any questions that you may have. So the first question that's come up is, how do you calculate the points for the CPP index past two? 
Sure, I can answer that. So, um, and I forgot uh, Deborah Hernandez, one of our admission counselors is also here um, to answer questions. I didn't want to leave her out, sorry about that. But um, how we calculate past two, some of the points are fixed depending on what a student puts in their application, but some of the other additional um, items are also variable. So depending on how they may respond to something, it's a variable um, uh, point calculation. So I think the, the bigger thing is not so much how many points you can get in uh, past two and how it's formulated, more so the 14%. So knowing that uh, past two is, is made up of 14% of the entire model and that students want to focus on answering all the questions in the application because that's how we come up with the, um, the overall calculation. And then I see the next question is, um, I think this may be as a follow up to a previous question. It says, hi, yes, test out, but other than just AP, is AP the only other way to test out? I think we're, maybe the Alex exam is uh, what this person is talking about. We have the Alex exam, which is offered online. It used to be in person. Obviously, we're not doing that anymore, but um, we have the Alex exam and it's a math uh, placement test and we will be offering that online. But that's mainly for um, to category two, we do know sometimes three and four students do do that, but it's not a required test and we don't, you know, it isn't one, you know, we don't use it to test out, we use it more for placement, especially for students in category twos to know what to place them in. Yes, and that was in relation, um, previously they had asked about um, will grades be determining, will be the determining factor for placement, yeah. and then can they also test out of a class with you? So that was a follow-up to that particular. Yeah, Alex isn't meant to test out. Uh, it's meant to test to place for students who are in category two to place in the right classes. Just to confirm how many events do students need for Project Caminos, uh, we indicated that four events are needed before December the 4th, and it included the website um, where you can find the list of all those events. So here you'll be able to see as more questions come in, we're here to answer your questions. We know that Cal State Apply opened October 1st and so we've seen some students are a little bit slow to begin their application process um, and maybe they have heard that they have until December 4th to, to submit their application. Again, we want to encourage them to begin to apply as soon as possible. This is the best time to try to get um, virtual support for them as opposed to waiting until December the 3rd um, when everybody is trying to rush to get those questions in. But if you have students that have any technical questions with the application, we've listed on our website here, um, Cal State Applied Help Center, where they'll be able to do that. And then you have available also Cal Poly Pomona's Office of Admissions contact information, as well as the Cal Poly Pomona Education Opportunity Program contact information. And through both outreach and Project Caminos, we will be um, providing workshops with EOP in the days ahead. And I'd like to echo what the ZMR said about applying early. It's so important that students apply early, especially in this virtual world that we're in now with more demand on the, you know, we've heard some people struggling with internet connections and the last thing we want students to do is have trouble at the end of, the, end of this uh, now that we're all virtual. So we encourage students to apply early. It's, it, it's, it's always extremely, um, it's, it's just, we don't want any issues where they can't submit an application. Yeah, I was going to echo that too and say it's only been four days, if you want to say maybe four and a half days now since it's been open and, and we're up in applications so far. And so we're seeing an increase. So even though um, maybe students are at home and they have time now to fill out the application from home when they can't, couldn't have done it in the classroom. So that being said, you know, it's, it is important to fill it out early. We're here if you have questions. Uh, that's what Deborah Hernandez, uh, she builds those questions all day, every day. So we're here to help you guys, um, but students really should avoid waiting to the last minute, especially with uh, these new questions that were added. The application just keeps getting longer. So it's better to, to tackle it early. And so we have the question that came in. Can you please repeat what was said about students attending four of the CPP Project Caminos workshops? Um, sorry, my internet connection was not good. Um, so this is just to repeat. Um, 
Project Caminos is considered one of the campus partnerships um, for Pomona Unified School District and Chafee Joint Unified School District schools. And so students from both of those districts, if they, are, if they attend four workshops before December 4th of 2020, then they will be able to receive that special admissions consideration under the campus partnership. Zirmar, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. With the Project Caminos, just telling people how to check in, use their name, their full name, um, so that we can actually find them and make sure that we have the correct applicant and who actually participated in the workshops. Yes, and so when students go to the website through the registration process, um, we're utilizing Zoom, and so the students will be able to register through Zoom, and a couple of the questions include their full name. It also asks for their student ID number if they're coming from a high school, from one of our high schools, if that's something we strongly recommend that they are aware about. Um, and so we will be utilizing that information to cross-reference to the applications, and that's where it becomes so critical. And we provide tips uh, through our sites as well. And we all know how important this is, but we know students, sometimes they go by the name, and their name may be William, but they will submit an application that says Billy because that's how they go by. And so we wanna just continue to remind all of our students. And I know that you, um, that you out there, you do this. You remind our students all the time. And so we continue to echo the messages that you send out and letting them know um, that we definitely want to make sure that students use their full legal name, their date of birth, and that they don't um, transpose their month by the, by the day as well. Um, so anything information that we can help to make sure that the applications match, including knowing what that California student ID number is. And then I saw the question come in, um, can students from other districts attend the Caminos workshops or is it only for the districts that were mentioned? No, the workshops are open to any student. However, the campus partnership is only for the two districts that I mentioned. But yes, we welcome any student grade nine to 12th grade um, to be able to join in and listen. And some of the workshops include um, learning from our career center. You know, some students don't necessarily know what careers um, they wanna go into or what major specifically will lead into certain careers. Um, first generation um, workshops that we're going to be hosting as well, um, as well as our EOP program, learning about what the EOP program is and assistance with that step-by-step -step application. We do thank you so much for joining us today and spending the afternoon learning about Cal Poly Pomona's multi-factor admission model. If we don't see until we see each other in the next webinar, we wish that you remain safe. Thank you again for joining us today.